So very good morning to everyone. I am Krishna and I take care of the security practice here at Saro. I completed my bachelor's in engineering from Manipal Institute of Technology, which is a college uh, in South India based in Karnataka. And uh, I completed my degree in electrical and electronics engineering and I had a knack for cybersecurity back in my college time, which is why uh, I started my career with KPMG. And uh, I was working as a security consultant at KPMG before coming in together with Akash and Rohit and co-founding uh, Saro. And the aim of Saro here is to make sure that we improve the security and data privacy infrastructure of our clients. And that is what we have been aspiring to do. And we continue to do so from the day we have started this uh, consulting firm. Right. We also have Ursula and Akansha. Unfortunately, Nidhi would not be able to join us today because, of course, uh, there's been a lot of COVID cases recently and uh, she's not feeling well, which is why we asked her not to join today. So we have Ursula and Akansha. Ursula and Akansha were one of the first uh, full-time employees here at Saro. So it is a privilege to have them today. And uh, the webinar aptly titled A Day in the Life of Data Protection Consultant we will just walk you through the different roles and responsibilities that a data protection consultant usually goes through in their day-to-day -day operations here at Saro. And uh, the questions would be mostly around how they manage to do their work and what they can do to make sure that they stay on top of the technology and the ever-changing technology landscape as well. So I'll just uh, hand it over to Ursula for a quick introduction on uh, what she has been doing and how she came into this data protection consultant role. Right, over to you, Ursula. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Ushila Pandit, and I'm a senior data protection consultant at Saro. So my primary role here at Saro is to deal with um, GDPR compliance, as well as with uh, the implementation of various other laws, such as the CCPA and other privacy regulations. So I mainly work with EU as well as US clients. I also work with Indian organizations. And besides that, I'm a certified data protection officer. So a little bit about my background. I'm a law graduate from Christ University. And I joined Saro ever since it was a four member company and I've seen it grow. And um, so I mainly handled the entire data protection practice here. I'll hand it over to Akanksha to give her introduction now. Thank you, Ushala. Uh, hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining in. I'm Akanksha and I work as a data protection consultant in here. I am a certified data protection officer and as per my background, I am a national university graduate and as per my work in Saro, I would say I make uh, usually uh, make organization, uh, organizations uh, GDPR or security compliant and also help them advise and also implement the solutions that we curate for them. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that, Akansha. Thank you for that, Ushila. Thank you for the introduction. So as a data protection consultant, uh, this question I'll just uh, direct it to Ursula, right? As a data protection consultant, Ursula, uh, how do you start your day? For example, uh, when I wake up early in the morning, what I do is I uh, browse through a bunch of different news articles or something that can probably tell me how the data privacy landscape or the security landscape in general is changing. So how do you start your day? Um, so I usually start my day with a big glass of coffee, not that I need it, but I just like coffee in general. Um, so the same thing, I usually like to go through the news and I subscribe to a couple of news networks, say by IAPP. So I usually go through them. The next thing that I do is I join the daily standup that we have, where our team discusses the projects that we're working on and the progress that we're making. So I would say that this is the most, the best part of my day because we get new perspectives from our colleagues and we get to suggest innovative ways and the best way to uh, solve our clients' issues. So yeah, that's how I start my day. Right. I think it's also fun to notice that uh, every client that we have ever worked with, uh, they always have a different IT infrastructure, which just makes our uh, job more complicated and of course more interesting at the same time. Because uh, it is uh, security and data, data privacy does not work as a blanket control that you can put across the organization. So you really have to curate it, customize it, which is why we have our daily discussions. And we make sure that the team is, of course, the team catches up with each other because we have been working remote since the very beginning. And it is a very uh, good team bonding activity that we do. Right? We catch up daily and we share our updates and we make sure that every other member from the team is aware of what the other member is doing. 
and of course uh, we also want to make sure that uh, in case anyone is facing any troubles when it comes to their daily routine or daily questions we can just you know ask each other those questions and try and come up with a solution which one of our client faces so we have a bunch of calls which make sure that we keep ourselves updated then question would be directed to akansha akansha how do you make sure that you are updated with the changing technology landscape because uh, you know every uh, every day i read news articles and i see that a new technology has came in or there's a new uh, ransomware attack that is in an industry or there's a new data protection law that is being uh, drafted up somewhere so how do you make sure you are updated with all of these changing technologies okay so for that i would say uh, reading is the key um, and um, i usually uh, subscribe to various blogs and for people who are just starting with i would suggest that they should go on to find out resource centers and uh, for a reference one i would say uh, even if you're going on to read the iepp website resource center that would be helpful to start with and for uh, your basics and to have a better perspective towards uh, what you're looking for right thank you for that akansha so we also make sure that uh, we can contribute to this as well which is why uh, we also create a few whatsapp community groups wherein we just share simple updates of privacy updates that we find and uh, that our team goes through every day so we just collate it and make sure that it is easier for everyone to access so instead of going through google or going through different news articles what we can do is directly go to this community and you know just make sure you can uh, view all these different updates now personally i uh, when i woke up today i was reading through this news article and uh, funnily enough the news article was titled that how the data protection bill in india is bad for business now this is something that uh, piqued my interest so i just went through the news article and uh, they were actually the news article was against the data protection bill in the sense that they would it would open new compliance uh, that organizations have to go through which could just make it very much difficult for organizations to comply but uh, what they are forgetting is that uh, data privacy is a human right of course so you have to make sure that you inculcate it somewhere in your it infrastructure to make sure that you are protecting your citizens and your clients data i think sohan has a question and on how he can be a part of our whatsapp group uh, sohan you can just drop me a message after this webinar on linkedin you just share your contact number and we'll simply add you to the whatsapp group in case any one of you would like to reach out to us you can just reach out to us via linkedin uh, we'll definitely get back to you as well and uh, we will add you to this community and of course uh, feel free to add any different comments you have of course any views that you might have we are happy to take it in so uh, as you might also be aware that we have a sister entity saru academy which deals in data privacy certification so urshila what do you feel the certifications that could actually help you build a career in data privacy and why do you feel these certifications are something that could help you okay so first of all i think that certifications are very important because they validate your real world knowledge of privacy and you're able to demonstrate that you have uh, that you have knowledge of it and you're able to understand the law completely as well as its application so i think that if you're just starting out with certifications the first one that you should probably attend is ciepe which is again by a certification by iepp so i feel like ciepe should be the one that you start out with because it deals with the basics and it will give you a comprehensive understanding of the law and so these questions are not direct questions and they make you apply your knowledge and the theoretical knowledge that you learn throughout the course so i think that's what you should start out with and then maybe move on to other more complicated certifications like cipn that's what i would recommend also we have our own certifications and if you're a student who wants to uh, build their portfolio and show that you have valid credentials to become a data protection consultant then what you can do is start out with certifications that we have say for example we've come up with a new certification which is the data protection fundamentals course and that's extremely helpful because it starts out with the very basics so even if you haven't had a subject in say your uh, education and your course which is i think most of us then that would be really really helpful and you can also do like an advanced course which is the data protection officer course which is held by our academy thank you ursula so i think meera has a question and meera wants to know what law resources do you rely on so akansha would you like to take up that question 
Yes, definitely. So uh, for the law resources, I would uh, say I rely on various logs by law firms, which would be, I would say, suggestion would be first one would be Davis and Wright, and the second one would be Latham and uh, Watkins. And other than that, I would say we can also go on to for Indian uh, blogs or the websites that I would suggest would be the Spice Out Legal blogs and uh, likewise. So that would be the resource material I, uh, I rely on usually. And one suggestion that I have would be that to have the right kind of uh, connections on your LinkedIn. So even when you're scrolling through your social media, people are usually sharing blogs and their write-ups and articles so that you can always have a look at it. So that would be the thing that I usually rely on. Right. I think I agree with that a lot. So whatever content you consume, consume during your social media shenanigans, I mean, it is very important for you to consume the right kind of content. Even if you're using Instagram, and uh, you are actually uh, searching the browser of privacy or data privacy related articles. Instagram will also send you more of these privacy related articles or more of these uh, uh, articles related to what you're actually searching for. So the content that you consume on social media is crucial when it comes to building up your reading uh, skills and when it comes to understanding different uh, data privacy laws as well. Right. So I see that Prajakta wants to know if uh, it is mandatory to have a law degree to start a career in data privacy or GDPR. Ursula, what do you think about that? Um, so definitely not. While it is beneficial to have a law degree, uh, it's not mandatory. In fact, I feel like um, people with a tech background and some technology knowledge have an edge over lawyers like us. Because I realized uh, the drawbacks of simply having a law background because I didn't have any knowledge or barely any knowledge of technology and I had to learn on the job. So I've seen people who have a tech background and then pick up the law um, also just really do well in this career. So it's really not necessary to have a law background. Right, right. I completely agree with that because I myself am an electrical engineer, right? So I didn't have any idea about how data privacy laws work which is why I started with my journey with uh, security because it is more technologically inclined and it was easier for me to understand technology because I was from a technological background. Uh, but when, I, when it comes to data privacy, of course, I uh, read through a bunch of different articles. Then there was this book that I read and I would uh, highly recommend this book to everyone. It is called uh, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. So this book is from a professor who is, has been uh, watching this industry closely since the last 20 or 30 years. And this book really helped me shape my perspective. And uh, of course, it is a 600 page book. It has a lot of content. Uh, there are simply 20 pages to references, which uh, will give you an idea of how much the research this particular author has gone through. Right. Uh, so if you could have time, just go through this book. It will give you a very good understanding of how data privacy has evolved, how the different IT infrastructure has evolved and how all these uh, giant uh, tech companies such as Facebook, Google or, for example, Instagram, how they take care of your information, how they process that information. And they also actively try, try to change your behavior as well. So it is quite intriguing. And if you have time, I would just suggest you go through it. Yeah. Then I think we have a bunch of questions. Aritya wants to know how an IAPP certification course will be helpful for the transition. Uh, so Aritya, I will take up that question. Personally, what I feel is that if you're someone who is new to the industry or just starting in, a certification may not be the right choice for you because it is important for you to understand the different terminologies associated with data privacy. So you shouldn't just uh, straight away go for a certification as uh, such. You should read through freely available resources on the internet. You can go through YouTube videos, you can go through articles that are being published by law firms or data production consulting firms. So these articles would give you a very good understanding of uh, the different data privacy laws and how these laws come together and how you can actually put up these laws in your IT infrastructure. Once you have a decent enough understanding, then you can go for an IAPP certification because of course certifications are something that are respected in the industry. They are kind of a proof that uh, you are dedicated to this industry and you want to learn more and you are willing to give certifications for the same. If you look at the security industry as well, it works similarly. Certifications are really highly regarded, but it is not as absolutely necessary for you to have a career in data privacy, but it is very important and it will definitely put you ahead uh, from your peers as well. Okay, so Ursula, would you like to take up this question on how to approach for jobs in data privacy after certification and study? So I think the best way to go about it is first of all, maybe you could start with an internship to see if you really like the field and see the practical applications of it. 
just apply to any firm or any person that specializes in data protection and cyber security because having theoretical knowledge is one thing and that's important but it's equally important to know the practical application and to know what happens at the ground level so it says start out with an internship and then see if you like the field and how you're doing in the field and then jump into it as a job so i'd suggest that's the best way to go about especially if you have certifications already so akanksha do you have any other approach to this no basically the idea that you're suggesting that you should first see if you're actually interested in the area i would also say that first we should read about it learn about it and then go find internships and if we actually find ourselves to be interested then only we should uh, uh, go forward with the idea otherwise uh, i don't think that that would be helpful to us right i agree with that i mean uh, internships are really helpful which is why even we as a company we try to give internships first to uh, prospective students so that they have an understanding of how it actually works and of course we try and uh, you know also make sure that people are part of the client calls as well so that they understand the kind of communication that happens with the clients as well and uh, i think faith has a question related to this that if we were to have a consultation call with a prospective client how would the call go so uh, faith from a security standpoint i'll be answering this question uh, so the basic questions that i ask are that uh, i want to understand their infrastructure first i want to understand where they store their data is it on laptops or is it on the cloud or how do they access to their cloud infrastructure what kind of access controls do they have so these are some preliminary questions i ask then i really want to know if the laptops my clients are using are corporate laptops or are these personal laptops because uh, in the industry these days the byod or bring your own device policy is something that companies are accepting slowly but of course that comes up with a lot of security considerations or security measures that you have to take to make sure that your bweb uh, od policy is of course perfect right which is very difficult to do which is why companies mostly prefer to have corporate laptops it is easier to take control of corporate laptops it is easier to manage that device so which is why companies also uh, prefer corporate laptops of course if you consider the cost of this as well it is not very economical for companies to have it but uh, it makes more sense from a security and data protection standpoint and then once we understand this infrastructure once we understand the different uh, devices that they have in the infrastructure we also ask for a asset register of sorts so that we have an understanding that uh, this is the entire scope of consideration right even if you have an asset like a printer which is connected to the internet you are uh, at risk of a cyber security attack because any device that is connected to the internet it could potentially be hacked which is why this asset register is something that we focus a lot on and uh, surprisingly a lot of companies don't really understand the different assets they have even if they have procured it or purchased it they don't have a central register which is easier for them to understand uh, their entire it infrastructure so our first activity is to create help them create this register and help them create a security policy most companies might already have a security policy which is why we also do a review of it to make sure that it is aligned to industry standards and uh, some industry standards that we follow personally is the iso 27001 right iso 27001 works as a very good preliminary standard and of course we also look at nist nist the nist cyber security framework and the nist sp 853 which is a risk based uh, standard so we also look into these different standards and create our own framework to have a consultation call you know gauge the different questions that our clients may have for us as well so these standards really help now from a privacy standpoint i think urshila would be uh, able to take that question so urshila what would the questions be for a prospective client if you want to understand their privacy infrastructure so first of all i think that um, you have to first understand your client's organization by that i mean you can first of all look at whether they're startups or whether they're already um, in the industry for a very long period of time and this is very important uh, because this will determine your scope of work and also how you uh, strategize and approach the client so i think the first questions that we ask a client is like we first of all we try to understand their entire infrastructure and if they're a product based company we try to understand their product and if they're a startup uh, we try to keep things very very simple and we try to handhold them in the entire process so uh, the questions that we usually ask them is whether say they have certain policies and procedures in place and whether they have like a data protection officer if it's necessary to appoint one or somebody who's designated to deal with data protection matters 
it's also very important to ask this question because uh, most of the times our conversations we make our conversations tailored to a particular individual who we're in contact with so if we're aware that they do not know as much privacy we try to make it easier for them to understand and we try to explain all of our policies to them and how we're going about things um so when it's a larger organization what we do is we try to understand the already existing policies and procedures which they're most likely to have at least a few and most probably these will also be from a security standpoint that will be overlapping with certain privacy controls so for a larger organization it's more about understanding the already existing policies and procedures and trying to um you know come up with a strategy that doesn't completely overhaul the existing procedures that they have and we try to come up with policies that would um you know that don't require much effort from their end to integrate into their already existing procedures so that's how an initial conversation starts out and that's how we're able to build a strategy from there right uh, i agree with that i mean we want to understand the existing processes or the existing policies companies have and it also depends upon the industry that the our client is in uh, for example if it is a non technical clients then we would initially start with um, with awareness sessions as well we want to make sure everyone in the company understands what uh, security and data privacy actually means when we talk about it in a corporate environment which is why we also hold these awareness sessions to make sure everyone across the industry uh, different business processes different business verticals finance operations all these different departments understand their role in making sure that security and data privacy is something that is adopted across the organization so these privacy sessions are or privacy awareness sessions are something that really helps and of course a lot of clients also come to us because they want to make sure that their senior executives or their management also understand data privacy and security so these sessions are something uh, that we start with and from there we build on a support or a rapport with these people so that they also understand how data flows in their environment and also of course uh, a lot of people feel that if you have enough security solutions the answer is uh, simple right because you have security solutions you should ideally be not be worried about things anymore uh, but that is not how it works having security solutions and having people who take care of configuring these solutions is also equally important because security is not a simple plug and play uh, solution because IT infrastructures, of course, differ from every industry, from every client. Some people might use G Suite, right? Some people might prefer the Microsoft O365 version, uh, of course. So these differences makes our job more complicated, which is why we have these awareness sessions as well. So Shri Devi wishes to know if we would be able to share material of these awareness sessions. Uh, so Shri Devi, this is something that is uh, internally our data, something we call as our intellectual property. so we will not be able to share these awareness sessions but of course we have a lot of content over youtube which is free uh, all these free resources should be able to help you understand how you can more cognizant about security and privacy from a corporate standpoint as well as a personal standpoint since i am in cyber security and my friends know that i am in cyber security a lot of my friends come to me and ask me uh, the steps that they should take to make sure that their information is protected so i usually come up with solutions such as you should use a vpn you should use an antivirus solution of course uh, all of these solutions really help for starters uh, from a personal standpoint and i'll just go through the different questions uh, prajakta has a question that how is dpo work different in companies where the privacy practice is already implemented akansha would you like to take up that question yeah sure so dpo basically is one particular person who's designated to look at the whole of privacy in, a, in an organization so that is how it is different and organizations with employees are more than 250 uh, 250 or more uh, it is um, it has been made mandatory that we have a, a designated dpo and dpo would be the person who's going to look at all the compliance thing and also be the point of communication uh, with the supervisory authority the controllers and the processors uh, uh, whatever their uh, role in the organization as so a dpo basically is a designated post and that is to look at the privacy compliance and uh, with respect to all the uh, privacy regulations that are applicable right i think uh, i'll just like to add something here that for an organization where a privacy practice is already implemented ideally when a dpo usually starts with the role they should understand the existing practices that are being followed 
the first activity would be to review the internal or external privacy policies and also making sure that how the company is represented to the external world. For example, if you have a website, then ideally the DPO should start with that because a website is a very good data collection platform, right? Most websites collect data. So ideally you should start with there. You should look into your privacy policies and you should make sh sure that cookie policies on data privacy policies are absolutely accurate when it comes to your websites. Then when you start looking internally, the DPO should ideally speak to different stakeholders to understand that if data privacy is actually something that is uh, being propagated across the organization. If not, the DPO should start with different awareness sessions. They should have different stakeholders joining in these sessions so that they understand their responsibility. And from there, uh, they can also build a roadmap for privacy. For example, if it is something that they can achieve in the next six months, then they can probably put in more activities that they need to fulfill. Some activities would be easier for you to do, for example, to just propagate their privacy policies easier. But some activities such as implementing privacy enabling technologies, that is something that could be a challenging, but it depends upon the size of the organization as well and the kind of data that you collect. Shri Devi wants to know more about our challenging client with respect to privacy consulting. So Shri Devi, we don't really have challenging clients because we feel that every client has a unique case problem which we try to solve and actually something that we uh, usually follow with our clients is that no two clients have the same IT infrastructure right which makes our job different of our clients we have to make sure that whatever solutions we provide are customized or tailor-made across to our, as per our clients needs right so Ursula what would be your comment on this uh, what challenges do you think uh, clients usually have when it comes to data privacy Okay, so I think I'd like to shed light on two aspects. So the first one is that the main challenge, I mean, I think that we have it in organizations also face this problem when it comes to privacy compliance, is that when they're operating in multiple jurisdictions, it's so difficult to keep a track of the laws that you have to comply with. And especially if it's like, say, they're working in the EU as well as in UAE or Saudi, which has just rolled out new laws. It's difficult to comply with both of these regulations and to map out all of these controls. So that's a difficulty that we face and organizations also face. I think that's one of the toughest ones. Apart from that, I've seen that one of the biggest challenges that organizations have, or one of the biggest hurdles that even we face, is that organizations view privacy and data protection as merely a compliance matter that's being mandated by the law. So what happens here is that companies will mainly focus on documentation and they don't prioritize privacy awareness programs among their employees or their senior management personnel. So they simply have documents to avoid fines or regulatory scrutiny. So companies fail to realize that if they do have privacy awareness sessions for their employees and a management and anybody in their organization, it could reduce uh, the risk that the internal risks that are posed to a company. So what I mean by that is that when an employee is aware of what a privacy or a security incident is, and they know how to handle such an incident, the likelihood that a breach is going to occur because of an internal risk is significantly reduced. And so this not only benefits the company, and it creates like an environment of trust, and you can build your consumer base upon these strong privacy uh, principles that you have. So I think these are the two most, uh, like the biggest challenges that we come across. Right. So when it comes to data privacy, of course, these challenges are already there. But when it comes to cybersecurity, uh, some of the challenges that our client usually uh, puts up is that they are not sure where the data is. They are not sure at all which IT systems uh, are using what kind of data and how that data is processed. Now, uh, what it means for a uh, for an industry which is not technical, for example, if your client is someone from the creative industry, then uh, their visibility over their data is so very less or very minimal. But the data or information that they actually hold is, of course, very confidential because they are dealing with advertising and they're dealing with all these different creative content, which is uh, intellectual property for all their different clients, which means that it is, of course, it is very crucial for them to protect that data. And if they also look into their security clauses or the security contracts with their clients, their clients would have uh, made it sure that all these different vendors that the client has, they have to follow a simple set of security and privacy protocols or controls. But most of these companies don't have the, those security controls and they realize very late in the, their business 
once they have their data everywhere across the organization that is when they realize that they should have done something earlier so that is a challenge that is uh, significant across all our clients they are not sure where their data is they don't have the right kind of visibility for it as well and uh, a lot of our work revolves around meeting deadlines so uh, akansha what is your take what is what are some measures or steps that you take to make sure that you meet deadlines effectively to meet deadlines i would say we need to strategize and plan well uh, at the first hand uh, itself and whenever we're um, uh, onboarding a client or having talks with them or having uh, uh, conversations with them to start off a, a compliance uh, project we should uh, ob- always always make sure that we have a set timeline on our minds and there should always be a open channel uh, channel for communication for that particular uh, timeline so that from both the ends we are making our efforts to stick to that um, timeline and uh, with respect to the uh, deliverables that we have it it shouldn't really be just a document sharing this uh, document sharing exercise and for the purpose of implementation we need um, efforts and work from the clients and also so we need to communicate uh, to them that okay we uh, we will need such an uh, such time for the purpose of documentation and this would be the time that would be need for implementation purpose so uh, i would say uh, to stick to timelines we need to plan and strategize and also have a open channel for communication with the um, particular client right i think effective communication is something that really helps us meet those deadlines uh, so when you have the different stakeholders come into the discussions it is very crucial for us to make sure that our challenges and our expectations are communicated effectively which also helps up us in setting up the right kind of road map because uh, you know engagements cannot uh, go on forever the companies or our clients expect us to improve their privacy infrastructure by a particular date which is why uh, when we have these discussions with the stakeholders we clearly communicate our uh, expectations and we also understand their expectations as well and in case of any delay which happens due to any unforeseen circumstances such as covid for example uh, we make sure that we communicate well in advance to our client that it is something that will be pushed because of of course a natural disaster or a pandemic right these are things that would not be in our control but communicating that to the client and making sure they understand how we can still complete the engagement on time and we can also make sure that all their concerns are something that we take care of uh, it is crucial and personally what i do is that uh, to make sure that i manage my time effectively i i have created an internal tracker for myself uh, it is a basic excel sheet wherein i track my status of different clients or my activities or my day to day activities i do it so that it's easier for me to look into that sheet and make sure that i don't miss activities that i was supposed to complete today because uh, there are a bunch of activities when it comes to dealing with clients and when it comes to making sure that our deliverables are also shared right so we have to make sure that all these deliverables are shared on time if there is any kind of dependency on our colleagues or our uh, or the client itself we make sure that we communicated it and we also make sure that we understand the deliverables that have to be sent on a particular day so yeah making an internal tracker or making a tracker on an excel sheet for yourself is absolutely helpful there are also uh, some platforms you can use uh, for example i think some people use notion to manage their time better or personally within saro we use a lot of different platforms such as monday.com or asana to track our project or to make sure that all the projects are completed within the stipulated deadlines so that is also something we do so urshala when dealing with clients you have dealt with a lot of different clients so what is a common compliance mistake that businesses make what do you feel that some it is something that companies should uh, you know start with when they open up a new startup what is that one compliance mistake uh, most businesses make so i think that they don't start out at the beginning and so i think that the first step that i recommend any company to take irrespective of whether you're a startup or you've already been in the field for a long time is to do a data mapping exercise so this exercise is very important because you will find out what kind of data your company is collecting and processing so this could include personal data and sensitive personal data that you might not have even been aware of because you never did a data mapping exercise so through the mapping exercise you'll also be able to find out the entry points of this data and so i think that we noticed that this is one of the mistakes that organizations don't even know what kind of data they're collecting 
So I'd suggest that the first step that you should take is to conduct a data audit. So if you feel like this is going to take too long or it's going to be a very complicated process, that's not true. There's a lot of tools in the market that allow you to now automate this process. So say one tool that we've recently discovered and that we like to use on our projects is um, called Privado. It's their data mapping tool. And maybe we'll provide a link to this tool and you can read up more on it and see if this is helpful for your organization. Right. Uh, so I completely agree with that. I think data mapping is a very crucial step that any startup could do. And it is uh, best to do it as soon as you start, because once you have your data environment everywhere, uh, data is everywhere across your organization within your corporate systems or different IT solutions that they, you may use. Right? It is easier and it is uh, suggested to com- conduct this activity when, it, when you start with your organization. And uh, one of the other activities that I would personally suggest is data classification. So a lot of our documents that we use are mostly Word documents or PowerPoint presentations or Excel sheets. So you don't really need a data classification tool initially. What you can do is you can put in simple terms, you can put in uh, simple blocks such as confidential or internal or public. So that is easier for you to understand what kind of data you're dealing with and what kind of data is uh, going to different IT systems, be it external or internal at the same time. I think uh, there's a question, how can internship be possible for experienced people for, uh, who are in the legal and finance industry for the last 15 years? So I think what Syed wants to know is how Syed can build up data privacy career with an experience in legal and the financial industry. Uh, Akansha, would you like to take up this question? Yes. So if you have that kind of experience already, I would say to give it a head start, definitely go for a certification as already been discussed by Ursula. So that is going to give you an edge and better overview to all the things that are required for a privacy career. And once that you have those insights, you would be uh, good. And the edge of the experience that you have, I think you'll be very good with that. Right. So if you are someone who's been in the industry for a while, you have an understanding of different business processes. So you already have a head start when you compare uh, yourself to any other professional in the industry, because uh, being in industry for 15 years, of course, gives you that understanding of the different processes and how these processes work with each other, which is why uh, to you, for you to transition into a data privacy role, a certification will definitely help. But at the same time, it is important for you to keep yourself updated with the changing laws and with the different laws. And uh, if your organization, if your current organization already has a data privacy team, I would also suggest you to get in touch with someone, someone who works in the data privacy team actively. And of course, ask them for any kind of assignments they could assign to you. And uh, if you try to help out the data privacy team, you would have a better understanding of the internal workings. But if you don't have a data privacy team within your company, I would suggest you to go through different articles and go, uh, speak to different people who have been in industry for a while because they can give you a heads up or they can give you more insights on how you can build a data privacy program. If you are someone who's the say the legal head of the company and you want to like, take care of the data privacy matters, then uh, speak to someone who has been in the industry and who has actually built up data privacy programs from scratch. They would give you some quality insights and you could definitely use it uh, within your organization as well. Pankaj wants to know who in the organization is supposed to conduct data mapping. Is it legal, IT, or DPO? Uh, Ursula, if you would like to take up that question. Sure. I think that everybody, all the relevant stakeholders in the organization are responsible. So while you can say that the DPO is responsible for data protection matters and he can assist in the data mapping process, but it's extremely important for stakeholders to take part in this. So I would say it's everyone who collects data. Say it's your IT department, it's human resources. All of these departments will have to be involved in the data mapping process. So it's a collective effort. So you can say that the DPO is supervising, but that's all the role that he's going to be playing. Right. I mean, uh, when it comes to data mapping, it is not an activity that a single team would be able to do. You would have to discuss with each relevant stakeholders the applications they use or the type of data that they usually go with. Uh, But when it comes to uh, overseeing or overheading the overall activity, ideally the legal and IT team together work uh, and to make sure that this data mapping exercise is performed. IT team is important because they are the ones who understand what systems hold the data. And legal team, of course, uh, would tell you more about the data privacy laws and regulations that you will have to follow while you conduct that data mapping exercise. So it is not an activity that could uh, be done by a single team unless you have a dedicated special data privacy team 
uh, within your organization that takes care of any privacy related matter even then they would need someone from the it team to help you with understanding the different systems right so pushala and akansha i would just uh, want you guys to share one step that you feel that a, a company could take to make sure that they are more compliant towards gdpr what is that one simple step that they can take uh, akansha will start with you yeah so as we already know consent is the most important thing right now so uh, to start with i would suggest that uh, organizations should focus on how do they capture consent and basically if they uh, capture consent for all the data they are collecting and processing so they should essentially have a consent banners or anything that suggests that okay we are taking up all this data from your site and are you ready to share it with us so that all the data subjects are aware that what all data are they sharing with the organization so i think this would be the first thing to start with right uh, what's your take on this ursula what do you feel is the first step that a company could take so like i said i think the data audit is the most important but apart from that i think the next step after you do a data audit would be probably maintaining a records of processing activities so even if you're not mandated by the law to do so i think that you should keep a record this is because it will enable it will enable more transparency in the organization and everyone in all departments within your organization will have a clear overview of what is being collected the legal basis for collecting this information and if the data is being transferred to any third parties i think that that should be your next step and also another step that organizations could take if they have a mature privacy uh, compliance is to have regular um, awareness sessions for their employees and this should be engaging and also regular so that you're keeping up to date with the advances in law and the requirements that are mandated by the law right so to for starters i mean consent is something that's very important as akansha highlighted and of course data audit is something that ursula highlighted which uh, is helpful when you look for a company that is just starting out it also depends on the clients or kind of data you collect if you are an organization that is working globally then you would have to make sure that you comply with all the different data privacy laws which are across different countries but if you are a company that is working solely in india for example so as of now india does not have a data protection bill it is coming up when it is something that has to be mandated by law or that is something where companies have to comply with it then that law is the first law that you would have to take into consideration because you are a company that is operating in india but it also depends on if you are operating in any other country you would have to make sure that you follow those data privacy laws as well urshila and akansha i would want to know from your end what do you think is one step people can take to make sure that uh, their personal privacy is something uh, that they can take care of so what is that one step which can you know enhance their personal privacy for example if i'm using instagram or all these social media platforms i'm particularly concerned about the data that they collect and uh, i'm also concerned about the ads that i see because it would also shape my behavior and it would also shape my preferences on what product to buy so what is that one step that you people suggest that could enhance your personal privacy so for that i would say that we should be very vigilant and we should be very sure whenever we are going on to clicking on links or whenever we are putting up anything on our social media or say any place as soon as we put on uh, anything or on our search engine also we usually go on to see the ads for that uh, that particular uh, product or something so a first thing that i would suggest is very be being very vigilant about links that you're clicking on and secondly for all the information that you're putting up social media or say uh, search engines also automated decision making is also being done so we uh, make sure that you are putting in the right information uh, and uh, profiling is also done on that basis so uh, make sure for what all information you're putting in uh, and that's correct and up to the mark and update it right uh, i completely agree with that right it is very important for you to make sure that you uh, click on links only after you understand that the link was meant for you uh, so urshila what is your take what do you feel uh, you can personally do right someone from a non technical background especially what they can do to make sure that their privacy is maintained uh so i think the most basic step that people can take is to review all of the permissions that you grant to apps so as we can see like nowadays most applications will ask you for permission to your gallery to your text messages and your geolocation and things like that and some of these things might not be necessary for the app to run itself 
And so I think what you can do is review the permissions that you're granting, regularly look at it. And as soon as you're installing the app, read through what permissions they're asking you for on your mobile phone or your device and only grant them access that's absolutely necessary to use the application. Right. So that is a very good starting point, uh, reviewing those uh, permissions that you grant these different applications. And uh, some of the steps that I personally take to make sure that uh, I can enhance my data privacy. And of course, it also includes something that Snuti has mentioned in the chat denying uh, tracking by third party applications right that is a very good point you you should ideally deny tracking because if that application does not really require your location it is not something that you should provide to it right then other uh, the other thing that smruti mentioned is that reading about the cookie policy and clicking on managing the preferences so which cookies would be applicable for you is something that you can choose for companies who are uh, you know, also making sure that privacy is something that they can count on and privacy is something that is followed across their organizations. So these organizations would ideally have a cookie preferences tab on their websites, which helps you make sure that you can manage what kind of activity or what kind of data that particular website will collect off you. And uh, personally, there are also a few applications that I use. Uh, for example, the browser that I use these days is Brave. Brave is a browser which uh, denies third party applications by default. It denies tracking, it denies ads, all, all, all of that stuff. So things that you would usually see on your Google Chrome or Firefox, or any other browser, Brave automatically denies all these different uh, ads or different malicious tracking uh, cookies that uh, websites try to put on your uh, visits. So uh, using privacy preserving technology or applications is also very helpful in making sure that your privacy is in your hands. Also, I think VPNs are something that are very important. VPNs would also uh, make sure that you have some kind of protection when you're visiting any, uh, you know, public Wi-Fi especially. So when you're using public Wi-Fi and if you're using any kind of free Wi-Fi, you should ideally use a VPN. It would make sure that your data is encrypted. It would make sure that whatever data you, that you're transferring is something that is secure. And a VPN also, uh, when you take care of VPNs, you should have to make sure that it, it is a VPN that does, does not log your activities because if a VPN solution is logging your activity, then in the end, you are not actually protected. If those logs are breached, if those logs are made publicly available, then all your browser activities are still publicly available. So you have to make sure that when you take a VPN, you take a VPN which does not capture logs or has some kind of protection over it. So those are some tips that I could personally think of when it comes to preserving my personal privacy. And uh, one other, of course, thing that I follow is that I create an ID, a Gmail ID or a user email ID, which is not being used for my financial websites or my applications in general. So it is a website which is solely for downloading content. Now, when you visit a few websites, you will see that uh, these websites ask for your email ID, right? Just to make sure that you can download a report which is publicly available as well. But to make sure that uh, they have some kind of insight on who visited their website and to enhance their marketing capabilities, these organizations would just randomly download your or ask for your email ID. And this could be your actual email ID, which you're using to communicate for, to your clients or an email ID, which you use for your financial applications or for, for example, your bank accounts. right? And this is not an email ID that you would want to give to a third party which is why I personally use a separate email ID just for the sole purpose of uh, taking in content, content that I can use from the internet. Also, what I do is I use a bunch of free uh, temporary email ID creators. So these uh, temporary email ID creators really provide you with an email ID and, and an inbox, a dedicated inbox. So as soon as you get your content on that inbox, that ID is not used anymore. So you just download your content and you don't have to worry about using your personal ID or even your name coming up to that particular client just because you want to download some publicly available report. So those are some steps that I personally take and uh, I would also suggest that you guys could also take, right? And I think this brings us to the, to the end of our session. And I would just uh, dedicate the next five minutes in case there are any further questions that you would like us to answer. Urshula Akansha and myself are happy to take it up. One question that we didn't answer, what is the impact in the life of a data protection consultant due to the saga around the EU privacy shield being nullified? And what are the steps that we should take to comply with the current requirements? First of all, um, with regard to what is the impact, 
So we've seen that it's drastically impacted organizations because most organizations are using, say, cloud service providers and organizations that store data in the U.S. So there is a transfer from the EU to the U.S. And by result of the invalidation of the EU privacy shield, there's new compliance like controls that have come up. And one of the most uh, important ones that have come up is something called a transfer impact assessment. And we spoke about this last Friday. So Ashish, you can refer to that webinar if you'd like. But just a little bit of background about what a transfer impact assessment is. It's basically an assessment that you have to do when you're transferring data to a third country that doesn't provide an adequate level of protection that's equivalent to the GDPR. So what you're trying to do is assess the um, how the law is playing out in the third country and whether it allows governmental access to data and what is the level of protection that the data is getting in the third country. It's also a requirement to determine the additional technical and organizational measures that you have to put in place when you're transferring data. So I'd say that that is one of the steps that you would have to take. Right. Uh, I think that was a good answer, detailed answer, Shila. Thank you for that. I think we have a bunch of other questions, uh, which I would just pose to Akansha this one. Right. So Smuti has this question where she says that a lot of organizations send reports containing personal data to ministries in their respective countries. So are they excluded from being treated as third parties since it is a legal requirement to share these reports with ministries? Uh, Akansha, what is your take on this question? Yes, as per the existing laws that we have, even if we don't have a, a definite uh, data protection law already, as per the IT laws also, that comes under exception. And if we're looking at the PDP bill that was uh, tabled, under that also the ministries and the government organizations have been put under exception. So that data when shared would be under exception only. Right. So uh, I would just like to add to this that in light of uh, a nation's national security interest, if the government asks for some kind of data and there is no law or there is a law that specifically tells you that the government can ask for that data in lieu of, of course, national security interest, then the companies would have to send some kind of personal data. But yeah, of course, uh, this also raises the question that data privacy is somewhat hampered here because you are sharing data to a lot of different government departments and you want you are not even sure if the government department would be able to make sure that your data is secure. Uh, when it comes to private organizations, you have some kind of assurance because uh, they would have to take necessary measures or their business would be impacted. But when it comes to governments, it is uh, it becomes genuinely more difficult to hold the government accountable in case of a data breach because, uh, you know, because government, of course, they are the one who draft the laws. So it is generally more uh, difficult for you to hold them accountable. So that is there. Right. So Smriti says that in UAE, we share data with ministries. Every company does that. That's why the question. So I get it, Smriti. Uh, that's a very valid question. A lot of companies actually have to share their data, but it depends upon the government and the kind of data that the government asks for. So not necessarily uh, all sensitive personal data will be shared. Only data that is relevant for actual functioning of that uh, information is something that you can share with the government. In the EU, the GDPR, sensitive personal data is something that is held in the highest regard. If you have to share any kind of sensitive personal data, you have to make sure that you share it for the right reasons. So the kind of data that the government would collect would ideally be not sensitive. It would be something that they used for their general tracking. But of course, it depends from government to government. So I can't really comment on uh, what kind of data would they collect. Uh, what is the best risk management practice used for used to mitigate data privacy breach. So Ursula, uh, what do you think is the privacy risk management practice that you follow or you make sure that is something that is being communicated to organizations effectively? What is that privacy risk management practice? Um, so like I've said multiple times, I think awareness among employees and letting them know what exactly would constitute a breach is very important because employees would be sharing confidential information or even more sensitive personal information and they might not realize that this itself could lead to a breach so i think uh, doing awareness sessions among employees and you know sending them email reminders that what would constitute personal information and confidential information for the organization is an important risk management strategy that most companies can take of course awareness is something that we uh, stress a lot on 
making sure that all employees and all users of your technology are aware of their data privacy rights and the principles that you follow is something that should be uh, communicated effectively. So that is the first step that you can take. Any other questions that you may have, you can directly post it to our LinkedIn. You can, you know, message us on LinkedIn. We would be happy to take it up. And I hope this session was something that was fruitful for you. There were some valuable insights that you guys got from this session. And in case you have any further questions or follow-up questions for us, you have our LinkedIn profiles like Krishna, Urshila, and Akansha. So feel free to just drop us a message on LinkedIn. And thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining in. Thank you so much for your time. Have a good day.